My spouse, Andrew, is on faculty at Georgia State and has recently started taking Reggie, our four-year-old daughter, to their women's soccer games. The team plays on an outdoor field with just one small set of aluminum bleachers for the spectators. Georgia State women's soccer doesn't draw huge crowds, apparently. Not yet, at least. So the smattering of folks who turn out to cheer for one team or the other, they all sit pretty close to each other on these shared outdoor bleachers. Recently, I joined them for a game, and Reggie, he's very eager to orient me to this ritual of theirs, points to the GSU team, and she said, look, Mama, those over there, those are the good guys, the ones wearing blue. And she'd cheer for them, saying, yeah, the good guys scored a goal. And then say, like, oh, no, the bad guys are running away with the ball, which was amusing to me, and I, I think to most of the people around us, too, even friends and family of the bad guys, because she's four, uh, and it's cute. And it struck me watching her how early we learned to parse the world in this way. Good guys, bad guys. People we're rooting for, people we're rooting against. We read history this way, right? Who is on the right side or the wrong side of history? And given how polarized our politics in this, are in this moment, the lens easily applies there too, to that arena. Good guys, bad guys. Of course, who's who depends on where you're standing. I should pause and warn you, though, this isn't the kind of sermon where I go on to say that uh, when it comes to politics and our common life together, we should resist villainizing one another at all costs and just come together in search of common ground. Partly that's because what's happening in our country's politics today is so alarming and dangerous. We have on one side of the arena an increasingly powerful, coordinated, well-funded, so-called Christian movement, aiming to reinstitute voting restrictions to limit black political power and thereby undermining our imperfect, yes, but essential practice of democracy. We find a sustained, obstinate refusal to take any meaningful action on behalf of our planet, despite evidence that we're now in a state of emergency. There's an insistence on superintending something as intimate as the reproduction of life without demonstrating love or respect for the complex, holy lives of pregnant people themselves. And we have the constitutional right of religious freedom being leveraged as an ideological weapon of discrimination. And so when one political contingent seems so intent upon militating against human life in these ways, and of course, I'm speaking for myself here, when you have this on one side of the arena, to be honest, it's pretty easy to feel, for me, to feel on the right side by comparison, on the side of love, of justice, of true, quote-unquote, biblical values. And I don't think it's wrong, actually, to be willing to say, yeah, I think what's happening over there, that's sin, to call it like it is, and to want no part of it. But I also recognize that to stop there with a feeling of holy anger and a sort of relieved distancing of myself. To stop there is to find myself squarely aligned with the Pharisee as he appears in today's gospel lesson. This story, this parable, is also one that has its good guys and its bad guys. But Jesus plays on his hearers' assumptions about who's who and which is which in relation to God's judgment. We modern Christian readers probably assume the villain of the story is the Pharisee, right? Because we've heard the gospel stories so many times, we know that when Pharisees appear, Jesus is usually criticizing them for something, so they become like the default anti-heroes in our reading of the New Testament. But the people listening to Jesus, Jesus teach would have had the immediate opposite assumption. To them, the Pharisee is clearly the protagonist. Pharisees were, we know, religious leaders doing their best to live upright lives in a complicated world, a world as complicated as ours. And they were also working hard to preserve and protect the religious identity and traditions of the Jewish people under the man manifold threats of occupation, which was, you know, a noble mission by all counts. The tax collector, by contrast, this is someone who was like the local enforcement arm, the muscle of the Roman occupation. And this one, the one in the parable, is a Jewish tax collector. We know that because he's praying at the temple, which in a way makes it even worse because he makes his living exploiting his own people. 
You might imagine a Palestinian in the occupied, right now heavily besieged West Bank, surveilling, fining, and imprisoning fellow Palestinians on behalf of the Israeli government, and getting rich in the process. And imagine how that person would be received. The Jewish tax collector was thought of as a traitor, morally bankrupt, probably almost universally disdained. <clears throat> so it's clear. Here you have someone working for the people, at least trying, and someone who's unambiguously working against them. And Jesus places each of them praying at the temple and tells the story. You have the well-intentioned Pharisee saying, thank God I don't spend my days terrorizing and plundering my neighbors like that person over there. Which you can imagine the hearers would have been like tracking, probably nodding their heads. Yes, no one with any shred of conscience wants to be that guy. And then you have the tax collector who maybe surprisingly, I don't know, has a similar assessment of his own moral standing. Like unable, unable even to raise his head, just heavy with grief. The tax collector beats his breast and says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And who goes home justified, Jesus says. The one thoroughly caught up in evil, begging God for salvation. This parable is of a piece with other teachings of Jesus that we're familiar with, that viewed from a certain angle can strike you as almost unfair. Like, wait, how is it that the seemingly, the one seemingly decent person in this scenario is the one who comes up empty-handed? Sort of like the prodigal son story, which is also in Luke. Most of us know this one about the son who foolishly just, uh, you know, goes off and dishonors his family, squanders his inheritance, and then finally when he spent it all and has nothing left, he comes home ashamed, dishonored, and to his surprise and other surprise, he's welcomed back by his father with open arms and this lavish party. As a child who admittedly identified with the older brother in the prodigal son's story, you know, an earnest eldest child who follows the rules and did what I was told, I found parables of this kind confusing. Like, wait, is the lesson here that I'm supposed to get lost in order that I can be found? Like to do a bunch of bad things so I can be really sorry about it and then be forgiven? But also, isn't the Bible and everyone at church telling me to be good, follow the rules, stay on the straight and narrow? Like, I don't get it. The bad ones seem to be Jesus' favorites in all the Bible stories, so I feel like I'm getting mixed messages here. And it, it's true that there is a tension. You know, there's a productive, parable, a produ productive paradox in these parables, no matter how you look at them. But I think I, I'm, I understand a bit better now that Jesus is not commending, advising people to get lost or, you know, team up with the forces of evil in order to experience God's grace. Rather, he's pointing to the tax collector, eyes wet with tears, and saying this person gets something. This person gets something that, depending on one's social location or life experience, one could possibly choose to ignore or overlook. And that is that this world of ours, in which we are all intimately connected, this world of ours and each one of us in it needs to be made right in a way that we couldn't possibly accomplish all on our own. This is the biblical notion of the fallen creation. And we know this, we, we look at the world, we're in it. We look around and how it's ordered, we see its injustices, its tragedies. We all live with our own personal grief and pain. We feel this. You can look from any one person's life on this earth with other humans to the global history of all of humanity and find fragmentation where there should be wholeness, violence where there should be love. All of us together, the whole situation and all of us within it need saving. And the tax collector gets this, like not just theoretically in his head, he feels it in the truth of his body, the whap of his fist against his chest, the weight of his head. He grieves how much is wrong and how much he himself needs writing and he cries out to God for help. And it's this spiritual posture that Jesus commends daring his followers to long with the tax collector for salvation. The Bible is full of references to this kind of longing. 
As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God, sings the psalmist. And Jesus' own words, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And in the reading from 2 Timothy that we heard this morning, Paul anticipates himself receiving a crown of righteousness, he together with all who have longed for Christ's appearing with all who hunger for the world and their own lives within it to reflect the love made known to us in Christ instead of the greed, domination, and death that seem everywhere to reign. This is not some esoteric knowledge or feeling. All one needs is some firsthand experience of this world and perhaps a willingness to open one's heart and look around. Our fictional Pharisee in the parable may have been doing well for himself on many counts, but I bet there was a part of him too that wanted more wholeness and healing for himself and for his people. And if he dared, could have stood shoulder to shoulder with the tax collector and wept. But he didn't. And the scene ends here with each of them leaving towards home, one of them justified. But for the tax collector, this wouldn't have been the end, right? But a a beginning, an opening. Next comes what to do with the longing or what the longing does to us and with us because when it's felt deeply, it demands, doesn't it, to be lived. In the very next chapter of Luke, Zacchaeus, a real life tax collector, meaning one that Jesus has an actual interaction with rather than just tells a story about, Zacchaeus longs enough for what, I don't know, something, that he ridiculously climbs a tree to get a glimpse of Jesus. And then having met him, Zacchaeus feels compelled to make reparations. He promises to give half his possessions to the poor and pay back anyone he's defrauded fourfold. Upon hearing this, Jesus replies, salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is good news for all of us. We lost ones. It can be scary to sit with the suffering and wrongness and pain that plague the heart of our human experience. But when the pain of us finds us, as it does, bears down upon us, we too can beat our hearts and beat our breasts and splay our hearts saying, God have mercy. Knowing that in our unmasked desperation, God loves us and welcomes us home. Amen.